Welcome to DIY Garage. I'm your host, Kerry Holzman, and joining me today, one of my favorite guests, JJ from ASUS. JJ, what have you brought with you today? I've got three boards from our third generation of X99 series motherboards, two from our signature series, and then one from our new Strix series. Well, I can't wait to learn more about them. Let's get started. Well, ASUS may not be a familiar name to some of you out there watching. It should be because they are the largest motherboard manufacturer in the world and have been for decades. What makes ASUS motherboards different from other manufacturers? I think first and foremost is really our focus on quality. I mean, I think historically, if you talk to anybody that's familiar with us, that's really been our mandate in terms of what we go about when we talk about board design and development. And when we kind of wrap that up in terms of really what our goal is when we talk about bringing motherboards to the DIY market, it's about focusing on quality, reliability, stability, and then really incorporating, I think, industry leading features and functions to ultimately improve the DIY experience and ultimately give you a great platform that you're gonna love and enjoy as you build your system. If you ask anyone in the tech community, I think you'll find more often than not that ASUS products are coveted among those in the know. And what we talk about uh, in other previous videos, we've had you here recently, you had the uh, Z170 series motherboards, of course that deals with all the Skylake processors. And here I understand we're looking at the X99 motherboards. Now, what's the difference? Who are these for? Is this just for the enthusiast? So this is really squarely aimed at, I think, the highest end of the market. When we talk about um, DIY builders that are really passionate about looking for the absolute best experience possible when it comes to building a system, this is who we're talking about. Um, now this is going to be leveraging the current generation Haswell E, but also fully supporting the new generation or Broadwell E based processors. And really the advantage that we're talking about there is we go to a significantly higher core count than what we have on the Z170 based platform. We go to quad channel based memory configuration, so you have much higher memory densities, you have more PCI express lanes. So pretty much every category you're talking about an increase to a much higher level of performance. Um, and it's not just about gaming. While these uh, course boards all could make the foundation for an outstanding high-end gaming machine, they're equally well suited and maybe even more well suited to use that are really looking to push the envelope in content creation or advanced productivity. It's interesting to me how the industry has evolved from just a few years ago where nobody cared what a motherboard looked like. And now, uh, you guys, your job is even harder now because not only do you have to make a great board, but now you've got to make it uh, uh, sexy as well, for lack of a better word. And I'm noticing, uh, for example, the little clips here on the PCI Express slots are translucent. Yeah, the, the actual retention mechanism, it, we had to redesign it to allow, very similar if you guys have ever looked at a mechanical keyboard, and they use actually a transparent housing to allow the RGB lighting to effectively shine through and disperse more evenly. We had to do the same thing here so that the RGB lighting that's underneath each one of those could shine through clearly and brightly. You tie that in then also the lighting that's built into, let's say, the PCH section on the board or on the deluxe where it even goes into the actual Crystal Sound 3.0 section um, that you have here on the board, and you have a really, really nice stylized level of lighting that it's not necessarily about really being the star of the show, but more so about giving you a nice ambience and really enhancing the look and feel. So it allows you to have some really nice stylized control and also complements a lot of our product range too. We have uh, smaller form factor cards like our Nano series, which don't even cover uh, the actual full length of the PCI slot. So you can imagine when you install that in there, you can have full lighting that's entirely visible. So I think it's a really, really nice uh, level of control and flexibility it's offered. And, and as if that's not enough. Yes, right? definitely. As if then it's been, uh, then we go to there. the Strix level of the board, right? The Strix version of the board, mm -hmm. which is a completely different color scheme. Correct, and this is a kind of really, I think, meeting that uh, kind of darker color tone that uh, gamers are interested in. Um, so here, while you're gonna see that the board it does have orange on it in terms of the decals that are listed on there, it's a monochromatic board, it's pretty much black, so it's gonna perfectly fit with any type of color theme that you wanna go with. Yep. You've got RGB lighting that's built in here into the IO plate. You also have central lighting that's built into the Propublica Gamers logo, and then you also have that PCIe lighting that's there. So you have three different zones that are entirely customizable. So really the choice is up to you, and that ties into probably the last point that we have here on the aesthetics, which is gonna be the incorporation of our RGB LED header. Um, so this is something that we introduced on the Z170 series. We innovated, we led the industry here, and it's really awesome because it allows you to go ahead and connect uh, compatible 50-50 RGB LED strips that can be fully controlled by the motherboard. And then if you even interface that even further with compatible chassis like those from let's say like Fantex, you have the ability to control RGB lighting on the motherboard, the LED strip, and then the chassis all in full sequencing. So that's some really, really awesome stuff. Now there's a lot more difference between these boards other than just the aesthetics. But before we get into the what makes these boards different from each other, let's first talk about 
the foundation of what makes them all the same. Sure, we can definitely call this, uh, let's say, like our non-negotiables. Uh, historically, we've talked about a lot of our boards. That's what we try to talk about. Our first are going to be consistent features or improvements that you're going to find on all of these, regardless of whether you're talking about the Strix or whether you're talking about the Signature Series boards. And probably one of the biggest ones that's really cool is going to be that we essentially reinvented the PCIe slot. So right off the bat, you might kind of think to yourself, well, how do you do, how do you go by doing that? Isn't essentially a slot a slot? Right, and I've looked at it, and it, it does look different. That's correct, and, and we actually had to go through an entirely new process that's actually patent pending, and this new process and this new slot is what we call the ASUS safe slot. And so what we've done here is we've used an entirely new injection molding process to essentially take uh, metal and then work in conjunction with the ABS material that's used to make up the PCI slot and combine those together and then furthermore, add in a new soldering process uh, to actually bond that PCIe slot to the board and then incorporate a special retention hook that when you bring those all together significantly increases the overall strength and the torsion resistance of that across all uh, angles for the PCI slot. So when you talk about having a, a PCI slot that you can feel really comfortable and confident in terms of its rigidity and stability, this is gonna be an outstanding choice. In addition to the improvement on the PCI Express slot, I also wanna note that Dealing with electronics, a capacitor is not the same uh, across the board. One capacitor is not necessarily equal to another. So when we're talking about the, the components that are placed on the board itself, mm -hmm. the level of components that you guys are using on these boards, how do they vary and what makes them different from other manufacturers? So I think the first thing that we're trying to look at is making sure that the uh, total design, what we refer to generally is called the power topology, and then of course the components uh, that are gonna be providing power to the CPU, whether you're running stock or overclock, this is important, uh, is to be able to ensure something that is high in quality, so it's gonna offer a very long lifespan, give you a great deal of stability and reliability. And so when you talk about how this has been incorporated on the boards, we're using uh, high quality capacitors um, uh, on boards, let's say like on the Deluxe, uh, you know, maybe the A, you're gonna have 10K rated capacitors. So these have significantly higher lifespans, uh, longer lifespans that you're gonna have with traditional caps, which many of times are gonna be maybe 2.5, 5,000 hours in terms of the rating. Uh, they also have higher and lower temperature tolerances. Uh, we use very high quality, fully molded inductors. These are called your power phases. And then things like your MOSFETs and your drivers, your power stages are, are very high performance as well. And ultimately, um, while you might not understand all the technical details behind what these power components do, um, they're designed to be able to operate at a very high degree of efficiency, whether the board's running stock or overclock, and give you that margin so you can comfortably push this platform. Because especially with Broad Willie, you're talking about a huge number of cores to be able to overclock aggressively. And if you're looking to sustain those frequencies under load, that's a lot of demand. And this also then ties into what we call our digital power delivery and control design. So we have our Digi Plus VRM, and this is actually for both the CPU and for the DRAM. And what this ultimately gives you the ability to do is have a very high degree of granularity and control inside the UEFI or in the operating system, you can do it either which way, to be able to customize how the board works. If you want to be able to tune the board down to a uh, very efficient, low temperature state, uh, low power consumption, you can do that. If you're looking to be able to really have that entire phase array uh, give you the highest level of power output, but also maybe produce more heat, um, then you can do that. That might give you maybe better uh, stability when you talk about overclocking. That's all going to be customizable and controllable within uh, those digital power delivery and control options. So that's that's really cool. And going back to I think what you were asking about is in the heat sink designs for these boards is how's, how that tie into that experience. Well, yeah, one of the things I noticed between these boards just visually right off the bat was different heat sink placements. Mm -hmm. And that's a question that we get from a lot of people is that how much does that play into it or how much does a higher end board give me more than maybe the more entry board? Uh, when we talk about the overclocking experience, all these boards are gonna have an outstanding OC experience, whether it's manual or whether it's automated through our fiber optimization and our auto tuning technology. The difference comes more into play is that you can see that here with like the Dash A or the Strix, you have individual heat sink components uh, for the VR. And so that's gonna help you dissipate the heat very effectively, give you good de good degree of reliability. But if you really care the most about thermal performance, then you can take a look at the board like the Deluxe, which has a high, uh, high performance integrated centered heat pipe, uh, which extends not only from the VRM, but this goes into a secondary heat sink that's within the actual IO shroud. And this is very much in the same way if you talk about going from like a Nectu to a U9S to an Octua U14S. They both give you great cooling performance, uh, but one's just gonna be able to displace more heat and give you lower temperatures. Now you've mentioned overclocking a couple of times, and back in the day when I first started building computers, when you did overclocking, you had to do everything manually. It was really for the, the, 
the geeks of the geeks, the nerds of the nerds. Sure, for those in the know. And nowadays, you guys have this auto-tuning feature, which I used for the very first time on our uh, Intel Pro Rig build that we just did, and I couldn't believe how easy it was to use. Now, I just actually went into the UEFI BIOS and, and set it, and boom, I was already overclocked. It really was that simple. I didn't have to adjust all the minutia that you typically, uh, that I'm accustomed to in the past. Sure. And so again, as we continue on with the evolution of boards, you guys have also continued on uh, with this overclocking uh, auto-tuning uh, through software, but it's also through hardware. Can That's you explain correct. that? Yeah, uh, so this actually technology we originally invented all the way back in the P67 chipset. So it's been around for a really long time and we've consistently gone about refining and improving it through multiple generations based on our internal feedback and testing, but also directly based on the feedback from our users. And really what the goal here, uh, part of what we call our fiber optimization, which runs multiple things like automated overclocking, fan tuning, uh, digital power adjustment, and all kinds of other things, but specifically with the auto tuning, is to be able to easily maximize the investment that you make in high-end parts, specifically the CPU and your cooling solution. Uh, many users don't realize there's margin that occurs between different CPUs. So you have one CPU that might hit 4 gigahertz, another one that hit 4.2, and one that hits 4.6. And even between that margin, you have different cooling solutions, which will of course let you reach different results. What we ultimately wanted to try to do was make a single option that a user could go into, customize, and be able to fully maximize the performance of their CPU. I also understand that you can set the overclock per application? Yeah. So in other words, if I'm just browsing the web, I don't need anything overclocked. If I'm working in Microsoft Word, I don't need an overclock. But when I load my game, and I want my frame rates to be as, as high as possible, that this can, am I understanding correctly that I can program the software to overclock when my game starts. Correct, we have conditional based overclocking. So this is part of our Turbo app application. You essentially have the ability that going through the program, you can assign specific applications to launch with specific frequencies. So as you noted, if you're web browsing, watching a video, you want your system to run stock, low power consumption, quiet in terms of operation, you can do that. You jump into Battlefield 4, you want higher clock speeds, you can do that. You jump into Premiere, you want higher clock speeds across more cores, you can do that. The level of customization is the most extensive that you are has been ever offered on any motherboard. So when you talk about overclocking and overclocking your way, any which way, pretty much this board's got you covered. Now, since we're talking about overclocking and fans, let's talk a little bit about the fan controls on these boards. Asus has gone above and beyond when it comes to fan controls. How do you guys do it? How does it work? Um, it's through a lot of hard work, actually. So uh, for this generation, all the boards, just like everything we've been talking about, all of them feature our Fan Expert 4 technology. So this is pretty much the most advanced level of fan controls we've offered on any generation of motherboards, and once again, is leading the industry. There's actually even a new secondary dedicated fan controller IC to be able to open up even some more of the options that we're gonna be talking about. So first and foremost, when we talk about overclocking, when we talk about system cooling, you've noted this, you have a lot of different choices when it comes to fans. You have you know smaller diameter, you have larger diameter, you have different RPMs. There's all kinds of variability that comes into this, and this can be a headache in trying to ultimately get them to all work in conjunction at the right speeds that you want to be able to get the acoustics, right, the noise profile that you want from your system. And so to make this easier, as part of Fan Expert, first and foremost, we have an uh, automatic fan calibration process. So that means every fan that's connected to any one of the headers on the motherboard can be automatically profiled for its minimum and its maximum RPM range. And so this allows us to essentially store the information um, to be able to efficiently target a profile for that fan. So that if we set it to, let's say, silent, the actual fan stops, it's silent, right? If you want it at a standard level of uh, airflow, then it's standard. If you want to customize the fan curve, you can entirely do that. And the really cool things that we've done now for this generation is that every single header doesn't just fully support DC and PWM or three pin or four pin fans, but it can automatically set the actual fan type uh, when you go through the automatic fan, fan calibration process. So that's really, really cool because that streamlines you not having to go in there to the UEFI or into the software and manually setting, do I have a PWM fan for my chassis fans and then maybe a DC fan for my CPU fan, just going through the rigor mole of adjusting all those values. So you essentially have it automatically take care of all of that and then the level of uh, how you can control that is super precise, right? You can go in and control the ramping speed, you can go in and control the curve, how it responds to temperatures, really, really, like, really flexible stuff. So this is something I'm assuming one would set this up when you, you've built your system, you've installed your OS, you've set your overclocking profiles, you've set your fan profiles. Is all of this stored in hardware? Like if I have to do a wipe and reinstall of my OS, do I have to go back and reset everything, like my LEDs and, and, and everything? Or 
or does it all go right back to how it was? Well, that's actually the really cool thing. Um, for this generation, the uh, level of fan controls and even the fan calibration profiling works not only within the operating system, but also inside the UEFI. So if you're somebody that doesn't want to even load up the software, you can do this all within the UEFI environment. Um, and beyond that, you even have more granularity and flexibility if you really want a precision uh, set up your, your, you know, your cooling experience. You have temperature input mapping, which I know on the Z170 platform you were kind of blown away with. This was really cool. Is yeah, there that, were like 12 temperature zones on one of those boards. We yes, yeah, on the Sabertooth boards we just go to the nth degree, but on these boards you've got multiple zones, uh, whether you're talking about multiple PCIe input sources, uh, the VRM, the motherboard, the PCH, they all have different temperature uh, sources. And the reason why this is important is think about it from a perspective of cooling efficiency uh, and effectiveness. If you're playing a game like StarCraft and you've got a high performance, you know, 240 millimeter closed loop cooling solution, CPU temperature is probably going to be consistently fairly low because it's not going to really peg the CPU that much, right? Uh, and if your intake fans are the fans that provide airflow to your GPU, that GPU cooler might not be getting as much airflow as it should, even though that's having a full 100% load, right? Yeah, how would you know? Right, and so now what you can do instead is you could have those intake fans, instead of responding to the CPU temperature input, which is the way that pretty much all motherboards work, you could map it to the PCI Express sensors, which are right by the graphics card. So once that heat builds up there, it knows, ah, I should turn, kick up those intake fans, bring more airflow in to be able to improve that uh, overall cooling effectiveness for that section of the board. Now all this talk of performance and overclocking and cooling is all well and good, yet it seems to me, and I pretty much think it's undisputable, that the real performance bottleneck on most computers is the storage system. And, you know, I've been very impressed with the SATA 3 SSDs with speeds, uh, read, sequential read speeds of up to 550 megabytes per second is pretty standard until I experienced Intel's U.2 solid state drive or even their add in card, seeing speeds of, of 2600 megabytes per second on sequential reads blows my mind yeah. and that's an important consideration when you're selecting a motherboard is what kind of storage connectors you can attach to that board because as we mentioned before in, in uh, our previous uh, discussions the M.2 interface isn't the same among all manufacturers mm -hmm. so let's talk about tell us a little bit about the storage connectors here and, and what makes them high performance. So uh, it being an X99 chipset, you're going to pretty much get all the things that you would expect. So you, of course, have support for M.2, support for SATA, for SATA Express, and uh, U.2, because that's all natively uh, supported by the chipset. Where things begin to vary is going to be in how the designs are implemented on the motherboards. So first and foremost, for, uh, let's say, our M.2 based connections on the boards, um, they're all isolated, so away from any heat-sensitive zone. So a lot of times you'll see board vendors, they'll put it like uh, right below the primary by 16 slot, they'll put it above there, they'll put it right by essentially where the graphics card is going to be right by where the CPU is going to be. So you got a lot of heat build up there. For us, we're going to move it as far away as we can on the boards. So that's going to help to make sure that you have the best thermal environment for that M.2 drive. But as you noted, uh, an advantage that you're going to have a U.2 is going to be that it supersedes M.2 in terms that it offers much, much higher capacities while maintaining the great performance that M.2 can offer. So both of those interfaces can give you, of course, PCI Gen 3 by 4 based performance. So that's absolutely awesome. Um, but going to U.2 route, you're going to have the ability to go up to you know 1.2 terabytes and even greater with the next generation of drives that are coming to the market. And that's the cool thing about all three of these boards. In previous generations, you used to have to use what we call our HyperKit adapter to change an M.2 to a U.2 based connection. Now every single one of these boards are going to feature at least one native U.2 connector and a board like the Deluxe is going to give you dual U.2 on the motherboard. So that's going to offer you just absolutely insane flexibility and storage performance. So it doesn't matter what type of storage uh, route you're going to go with these boards, you're going to have that flexibility of going there. Now another aspect of performance is audio. We don't often associate audio with performance, but for those of us uh, that are heavily into gaming or into content creation, audio is a pretty major deal. And with audio being built onto boards, it used to be the case where the included audio was always kind of the... Oh, hum. It yeah. wasn't really that great. Yeah. So for this generation, we've gone ahead and continued the refinement and onboard sound design that we've had now for multiple generations. This really actually started uh, with the RG series of motherboards where they implemented the isolated audio design or the Red Path audio design. And definitely all these boards all feature a same type of design where we have an isolated audio section. Uh, we've got high quality audio grade capacitors, which are specifically designed for improved tonality. We've got an operational amplifier on there to punch up the volume for your connected headphones. Uh, you've got a depop filter there so you don't hear this pop when you reset 
restart or you shut down your system. Um, we've got a shielded codec, and all of this is really ultimately in pursuit to be able to maximize the performance of the onboard audio codec, which actually is pretty solid in terms of its uh, performance, in terms of the metrics of what it can provide. Uh, whether you're going to be playing games, or you're going to be watching movies, or you're going to be uh, listening to music, we really fundamentally want to try to make sure that the onboard sound experience is solid, that you're going to have a good, clean, crisp, reliable audio experience. Um, and for this generation, we've further improved upon what we've done in previous generations and uh, by incorporating what we call a pre-input power regulator. And this has ultimately helped to just uh, normalize and reduce the amount of noise that's supplied to the audio section of the board because while you're able to isolate pretty much to the majority of the audio section, you're still receiving power fundamentally from the motherboard, which is shared. So this just helps to maximize the performance for what we have when we're providing power there uh, and help to further improve that overall audio experience. So basically what you're saying is when you plug in your headphones, and I've experienced this before, uh, my audio level, like I crank it all the way up and I can still, it's just, it's not quite loud enough for me. Mm -hmm. Having that onboard amplifier uh, greatly helps when you're wearing headphones. Yes, for sure. But it can also offset and also amplify noise, being uh, hums or buzzes or even just static hiss. Yeah, you can have a, a lot of different things that can influence audio characteristics on a motherboard, so it's very important to have the layout be very taken uh, very seriously. Yeah. And that's something that we do a lot of painstaking design to. And uh, lastly, to note on that op-end side, uh, that is where you also have a little bit of differentiation here on the Strix board. It features dual operational amplifiers. So whether a gamer uh, plugs into the front headphone or to the line level out, they can actually receive amplification on the line level out or in the front headphone. Well, with the Deluxe or the Dash A, their operational amplifier is gonna be focused for the front headphone connection. I think another important feature to talk about would be the UEFI BIOS and how you can flash this. There's a lot of anxiety and concern over BIOS flashing or UEFI flashing, and this has also come a long way. Yes, definitely. It's something that we've really looked at. I mean, fundamentally, when we talked about at the very beginning of this uh, video about improving the DIY experience for builders is something that we've taken a look at very seriously. And uh, that's where USB BIOS flashback came through. Um, and that's featured on all these boards. So the ability to go ahead and update the UEFI on a low level, no CPU, no memory, no graphics card required. Just plug in your 24 pin power, plug in that flash drive, hit the button, and you can low level update the board. It's an awesome function that users, once they uh, utilize it, uh, whether it's in a time of recovery or whether it's just to update their board when they're first setting it up and they don't have to stress about putting anything in the CPU, um, it's an awesome feature to have. But for this generation, we've also tried to even make things even easier for some users. Instead of going through that process where you still have to download a file potentially from another system, which you may or may not have, we now have the ability to get your system up and running from the basic perspective, CPU, memory, graphics card, but now you can jump directly into the UEFI, have your Ethernet cable connected, and it'll download the UEFI straight in your system, and you can flash all within one seamless step. No software? No software required, so all within the UEFI. So I think uh, giving users this type of flexibility is awesome, and making sure that they always have the latest UEFI for the best stability, reliability, and compatibility. Well, one of the other points of anxiety is downloading the right BIOS update. So this just automates that, right? You're plugged in. process. Just connect your Ethernet cable, click the update process, and you're good to go. Now, staying along the lines of talking performance, another thing I often don't hear discussed about performance is networking. The networking cards used to have to plug them in separately, yep. and then the motherboard manufacturers started to include them, but you often weren't getting the best. Correct. There, were, there was definitely um, not necessarily always the focus to put, let's say, the premium or the, the best performing type of networking solutions. And uh, for us, we've really had now a long history of really putting the what a lot of users feel is kind of the industry standard with an Intel NIC uh, on our motherboard. So all of these boards all feature an Intel Gigabit NIC. It's natively part of the chipset, which Intel optimizes their platform for, so that's fantastic. So on the Dash A, as well as on the Strix, they're going to feature a single NIC. And then on the Deluxe board, you're going to have two Gigabit network ports. Um, so that's just going to give you a little bit more flexibility, especially if you want to run one for your internal network and then one you going externally uh, or for failover or for whatever it might be. Um, you're also going to have all of these featuring what we call our land guard design. This means that we've gone ahead and redesigned the actual housing for the Ethernet jack itself. And so it's actually done using an SMT production process, so surface mount technology. Uh, this is a far more precise way of uh, producing the jack and it helps us to actually put more diodes on board to be able to enhance against things like surge and ESD so that you get actually superior protection for the entirety of your I.O. because we already place a lot of this protection to, uh, circuitry on all the input connections on the board uh, like your USB and your front connections and things like that but now you're also having that protection for the actual Ethernet port. 
Yeah, that's a good point because I, as a PC repair technician, I have seen PCs where the customer says, I know there was a big storm last night and I unplugged my computer. Yep. Did you unplug your Ethernet port? And they don't. And no. they don't. And, and, and back in the day, it used to be the telephone line when they would plug them into their modems. Correct. Those were also sources of power spikes. Correct. And so this ultimately just helps to protect it. And adding to the performance piece, all of them also feature some form of packet priority control software. So if you want to be able to optimize uh, the packets, uh, whether it's going to be for gaming, whether it's going to be for downloading, whether it's going to be uh, for any type of network centered service, you have that ability to do that easily within the applications for these ports. And again, all of this performance doesn't really mean much if you can't plug everything you want to into your board. So let's talk about the connectivity of the uh, I.O. Yeah, definitely. All these boards are going to be stacked. And I think for all of us at this point, really what we care about is going to be what's the type of USB connectivity. because And how much, many. Correct. And what types, right, they yep. might have. Because um, pretty much all the peripherals that we're utilizing are some variant of a USB connection. So all of these boards are all going to feature, of course, native USB 3.0. They're also all going to feature USB 3.1, both Type A and Type C connections. So you have pretty much the most complete flexibility in terms of that. Um, beyond that, the Strix as well as the Deluxe both come implemented with a AC Wi-Fi. For the Strix, you're going to get 811AC dual band Wi-Fi 2x2, so that's a transmit the antenna design. That's going to be a 2x2 base implementation, while with the Deluxe, you're going to step up to a 3x3 base, so extremely fast. Um, beyond that, also, all the boards do feature our Thunderbolt 3 header. So this is a great option where if you're looking for the absolute fastest and most uh, flexible form of high-speed I.O., that's going to be Thunderbolt. And so you can do that through the adding card. And so it's very simple. You just go ahead and connect it to the dedicated Thunderbolt header that's going to be on the board. You drop in the card, and now you're going to have Thunderbolt 3 available to you. So whether you want to connect your high-speed external storage, uh, monitors, you want a daisy chain setups, whatever you're going to want to do, you have that available to you. And the deluxe version comes with this Thunderbolt add-in card. That's correct. While all of them are compatible, that one will come included with it inside the box. JJ, there's a lot of great features that we've talked about, a lot of them. Yes. So just, just to help our audience to differentiate between the three boards, mm -hmm. uh, since they do share the majority of things in common, uh, what are the key differences between the boards? All right, to recap, definitely they do have pretty much all the same features. Uh, everything we've pretty much talked about, whether it's the auto-tuning, the fan expert, UEFI, all that stuff is gonna be found on all of them. So your key differences are really gonna come into play in terms of key connections. So a board like the Dash 8 doesn't have integrated Wi-Fi where the Strix and the Deluxe, they both have integrated Wi-Fi. The Deluxe takes it, of course, to the highest level with three by three versus the two by two that's on the Strix. It also comes with dual NICs where both the Strix and the Dash 8, they only have a single NIC. Uh, you're also going to have some variation in terms of that storage, right? Where the storage on the Deluxe is going to be, once again, more robust, giving you dual U.2, dual M.2, plus it comes with more of those accessories, right? You've got that M.2 expansion card, you have the fan extension card, and you have the Thunder Thunderbolt 3 extension card uh, that are all offered inside the box, which, while the Dash A and the Strix are compatible with those type of accessories, they don't come natively with them inside the box. But fundamentally, when we talk about experience, whatever you're going to be doing, you've got a great foundation with all of them. You know, of course, you're going to have some differences in terms of the core aesthetics, uh, which, you know, that aligns with how you're looking to set up the look and feel of your system. Uh, but it's really going to come down to taking a look at the level of connections that are available on the board and seeing if that complements the, the, the setup that you're looking to have. My thanks to JJ from ASUS for joining us today. And that's going to wrap up this episode of DIY Garage. But let us know what you think. If you have any questions, uh, JJ often jumps in and answers those questions in our comment section below. Be sure to click like and subscribe. And also check out our new video shopping platform at Newegg.tv. For Newegg TV and DIY Garage, I'm Kerry Holzman, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.